Okay, this video is chapter 24, how to estimate IQ. I'm gonna talk a little bit about intelligence, both you know, assessing intelligence in yourself and also assessing intelligence in others and you know, monitoring your own self-progress, like metacognition. Um, this is all part of being smarter. And part of this book, you know, one of the titles is How to Raise IQ. If you listen to the university professors, they're gonna tell you that IQ can't be increased. That's completely nonsense. Basically, pretty much almost anything university professors say is not true. Um, I had a conversation one time with this lady technologist and she said to me, oh, it's in the newspaper, so it has to be true. I said, oh, it's in the newspaper, therefore it's not true. I mean, think about nutrition and health. Almost every single thing you would see in a newspaper is not true. Okay, so anyways, when you're talking about intelligence. I'm going to just share a couple quotes with you for starters. Oscar Wilde, the great Irish writer, it is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. Actually, Aristotle also said all men are born unequal. Okay, and I'm kind of playing here, but what I'm trying to do is, is get your mind thinking. So, you know, what we want to do is aim for what's the best we can be as individuals. And, or if you have kids, you know, help teach the kids how to develop themselves. A good thing is a growth mindset of Carol Dweck, the psychologist out of Stanford. The idea that if you put effort into something, you can improve. Seek out the best mentors and teachers for that particular subject. Okay, Michael Merzenich, he's a co-inventor of the cochlear implant. Here's what he says. How do you improve a brain? You train it. You train it every day. If you want to be good at playing piano, you practice every day. How do you worsen intellectual performance? You add noise. So these are great secrets of getting good at anything. You focus on it intensely. You train on it every day if possible. And you avoid distractions and noise. Okay, so I find that a very helpful to remind myself of that whenever I'm trying to improve performance on something. Okay, here's Peter Drucker, you know, the efficiency expert. He says, what is measured improves. Knowledge has to be improved, challenged, and increased constantly or it vanishes. Okay, so what does that tie into? Like, let's say you're a doctor. As a doctor, all you gotta do is follow the standard of care, whatever it is for your field, and whatever happens to the patient really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect what you get paid, no one cares. As long as you follow the standard of care, even if the patient dies, you can't be sued, okay? You know, of course, ideally, you should want the best for the patient, do the best for the patient, but what I'm trying to say is, if you are going to keep getting better, the doctors who keep getting better are the ones that want to get better. And it doesn't matter where they train or any of that other stuff. They just simply have a desire to constantly learn during the day. And there's really no incentive for that because you don't get paid for it. And it means you go home later. Anything you do, doctors tend to be worked very intensely. And whatever business or hospital or clinic they work for tries to get as much money out of them as it can by having them generate as many billing codes as faster. If I had to say, like, what's the most important thing in residency, it was probably to be smart, to be knowledgeable, to get the case right, to figure out the situation. But what I've noticed is once I got done with the residency, I got into the real world as being an attending physician, you know, uh, what is most valued in doctors is how much do they bill? How fast do they go to bill more? So that's not necessarily what the patient wants, but that's what the system wants, if you will. All right, so what we're going to do now, estimating IQ when you evaluate another person, and you use this to evaluate yourself as well. So basically, if a person's fat, now, by the way, you could have five in a row of these things be wrong, but the more of these things you add up and look at, the more likely you're going to make an accurate assessment. So in general, what I've seen is smarter people are more likely to not become fat. Sometimes very smart people are very fat, but in general, uh, smarter people are less likely to become obese. A sign of being slim and trim and energetic is usually a sign of intelligence that the person ages well. Yeah, there's exceptions. Some people are just lucky. But overall, these things add up. Looking at a person's hairstyle, you know, a good look is that the person's clean cut, well groomed. You know, if you're going to do business with somebody, like let's say a real estate agent, you want that person to look reliable and trustworthy. I saw this one real estate agent guy, he always went to mass every Sunday and he dressed in a suit and a tie and very well and people liked that because they knew they could always find the guy. He's not just going to run off with their money. They trust him. Okay, somebody who has a real crazy hairstyle, it makes them look crazy and stupid. You say, would I trust this person with an important business deal? This person looks insane. No, I would not trust him. That's a sign of low intelligence. Um, if they're poorly groomed and disheveled, that's almost like a disrespect for the other person is how it comes off looking or that they're homeless or something or crazy. Uh, when I was in a restaurant with my dad, I was just a teenager and the waiter had a really bizarre 
haircut with this long ducktail like thing on him. And I asked my dad, why did he cut his hair like that? My dad was a psychiatrist, by the way. My dad said, it's a neon sign that says, I'm going to be poor the rest of my life. Okay, so um, I, every time somebody would joke with me about getting a crazy haircut, you know, hey, why don't you get a mohawk or something like that? I always think about my dad, what he said. Now, okay, now I'm old and bald, it's a non-issue. All right, uh, looking at the person's face. Smart people are usually pretty pleasant in their behavior, especially in sort of like unfamiliar surroundings. You know, a person who has a rude facial uh, expression is um, usually it's a sign of them being stupid. I mean, a, a smart person knows that life is difficult and in order to get along with others and stuff, you, you have to be polite and nice, not just because it's the kind thing to be, it's also the smart thing to be. A uh, person who's bizarrely groomed, I'm, so I'm putting, ne subtract negative 10 points from their estimated uh, IQ. If they're doing all kinds of bizarre things, you know, they got some crazy look to their hair or, you know, their eyebrows pierced and all this other stuff. It's like they're trying to, you know, is it a cry for help or something? Whatever it is, you know, you don't want to deal with them if you can avoid it. Um, so I'm just saying these are things, you you know, if you got kids or something, you tell them, you know, it doesn't take any talent to act bizarre. You know, it takes talent to be creative, to produce something unique, not to act bizarre. Any fool, drug addict, scumbag could do that. So yeah, usually intelligent person, they're going to be more well-groomed, smile, friendly, pleasant attitude and affect. Are they dressed well? You know, they should be wearing a shirt, preferably a nice shirt, because a lot of teenagers, you know, and I was the same way when I was young, they just go out in a t-shirt. But in the real world, it matters how you dress. Go to the grocery store. I know if I go to the grocery store and I'm wearing, you know, a, a, tie, a nice shirt and a tie, I get treated a lot better than if I go with a t-shirt. You go with a t-shirt, you get treated like, you know, a homeless person, they follow you around or something. If you dress nice, then you get treated politely. So why not be treated politely? Uh, you know, how you dress is an indication. It's like a tool to tell people how they should treat you. It's the only thing they've got to go by when they first meet you to estimate who you are, what you are, and how you're likely to behave. Okay, so anyways, you can take a salesman and you can put him in a t-shirt and people are not going to want to talk to him or trust him. You put him in a suit and a tie, it's the same guy, but he just looks more educated and trustworthy. I'm not talking about right or wrong, I'm just saying that's how I believe it is. Um, also, you know, is the person dressed stupidly? A lot of teenagers, especially male teenagers, they'll go out on a really cold winter day and not even wear a jacket. I think they're kind of hyperthermic. So I wouldn't hold it as much against them, but it doesn't look too smart. Okay, people wearing their clothes too tight. It looks like they're trying too hard to emphasize the physical side of themselves, and it comes off making them look kind of stupid. Like if a woman's trying too hard, you know, she's got these big injected lips and all this other fake stuff about herself and tight clothes, you try to say, it makes you think she's just an airhead, you know, that she's got to emphasize physical, cheap physical features so much. Um, okay, conversation. Let's start getting a little more interesting here. Most people can talk well on familiar subjects, but an educated person will have a wider range of familiar subjects. Education doesn't mean smarter. Lots of educated people are stupid. Lots of uneducated people are very smart. But in general, there's, there's something to that. Okay, general intellectual ability becomes more apparent when a person has to speak about unfamiliar things. Most people cannot read well. I've been rather amazed because, you know, when somebody has to read something to me, I can get an estimate of how, you know, good their vocabulary is. And I've seen a lot of people who are strong in conversation, but when they have to read something out loud, they're relatively weak, even with relatively simple material. Uh, most people can barely write at all. Most people I've met in my life, even with their degrees, they can barely write their way out of a paper bag. Okay, and I've seen people who are pretty smart in conversation try to write something and it's just pathetic. And I think it's because most people don't write as a habit. It's not part of their job and they just don't do it. So whenever they're tasked with having to write something, they can't write very well. Uh, if a person can write well, that's a sign they got a high academic IQ. I mean, if they can write clearly, just to write clearly even takes a relatively high academic IQ. It doesn't mean they can write well. You know, really good writing is, is a lot different than just writing a, a clear memo you know, to write good, you, you need to have a lot more on board. You got to have a good vocabulary. You have to pursue the truth. Ideally, have good ethics. There's a lot of writers, even in the nutrition communities, that I think are dishonest and they're just trying to sell stuff and play games. And so they're writing while it might have a couple cute rhymes and jokes and, you know, quotes and stuff. It's sort of superficial. It doesn't have much lasting value. 
Um, I think better writing will often have a transcendent component, you know, uh, illusion or reference to classical things or biblical things or something, you know, beyond the scope, artistic or something that makes it better, makes it more entertaining. Um, the other thing I've noticed that's real characteristic of smart people, because I talk to some really smart doctors uh, on the phone and stuff when we discuss complicated cases, is a wise person has better self-control. They let the other person speak. They listen. Then they pause, you know, that they let it soak in, and then they reply. What I've seen in a lot of young people is they might have a high IQ for their age, but they're often very impulsive, uh, far too impulsive. They always think they already know the answer. They're in, always in a hurry. They don't allow the conversation to develop the topic. So they can never really learn as much as they potentially could. Um, so what I'm going to do now is mention a couple things from Aristotle. I realize this chapter is a little bit all over the place, but I think there's some useful stuff in here because one of the ways you prevent dementia is by being smart in the first place. You build cognitive reserve. And Aristotle was considered by many people the smartest person who ever lived. Um, I think it might be Isaac Newton, but Aristotle is certainly right up there. Okay, so Aristotle says, the first step to an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. That's a big quote. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. The first step to an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. You have to just be objective, let the topic go where it goes initially, and then, you know, discuss it openly. Let the other person talk. Okay, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Yeah, a lot of people, you can't really have an intelligent conversation with them because if you ever contradict their initial point of view, they get offended and the conversation essentially is over. Okay, it becomes a battle of wills rather than a desire to, you know, enhance each other's understanding of a topic. Aristotle continues, there are no wise young people. Wisdom is concerned with specifics as well as universals. Specifics come from known, to be known from experience. But young people lack experience. I think that's funny. There's no prudent or no wise young people. And there's truth in that. Young guy, no matter how high their IQ is, they just don't have the experience really to be too sophisticated. Okay, the highest activity, Aristotle's continuing here, the highest activity of a man is the pursuit of truth. The life of the intellect is the most pleasant and the best life because intellect is that which is unique about man. The greatest of all pleasures is the pleasure of learning because learning is continuous and enduring and can go on all day. It does not wax and wane like the other pleasures. Yeah, you can say eating food, you know, making the two-bag beast, but those are brief things in comparison with learning all day, which one can do. Okay, Aristotle continues. The aim of art is to show the inward significance of a thing. So that's beautiful. And what that reminds me of exactly is Ayn Rand when she made the quote that art is the concretization of metaphysics. So what it's saying is art puts into the concrete that which was before philosophical or theoretical. Okay, Ayn Rand loved Aristotle. Ayn Rand would tell you Aristotle is the greatest philosopher who ever lived, and wherever he went, wherever his influence was strongest, society reached these their golden age. And there's a lot of truth in that. And Ayn Rand is a real genius. You want to see a real genius, a real smart woman, just go read her quotes. Just go to one of these quote sites and start reading Ayn Rand's quote, and you're like, holy crap, is this woman start? I think she's the smartest woman who ever lived, by the way. Yeah, I know. She, people say she's a bitch. Any smart woman, they always call them a bitch. Uh, but man, was she smart. I've read a lot of her stuff. Okay. Um, her best her best book was The Romantic Manifesto about what is good art. That was, that was a masterpiece. That's better than Atlas Shrugged. It's better than anything else she ever did. Okay. Um, Aristotle continues. Ordinary words convey only what we already know. It is from metaphor that we can best get hold of something new. The greatest thing is to be a master of metaphor. It is the mark of genius to make good metaphors. It is the one thing that cannot be learned from others because to be good with metaphors indicates a deep understanding of the likeness of things. Okay, good. So, And also the reason why I went through all that is when a person has this philosophical sense of learning and understanding and of seeking truth and all that, they become smarter. <laughs> they just do. Um, they become a better writer and they become more interesting. So it's all good. Okay. 
All right. So, anyways, that, that's what I notice most in conversation with really smart people is they take turns and they develop a topic, they stay objective on emotion, and they pursue nuance. Versus when I speak to a lot of just regular people, they get all emotional and the conversation can never go anywhere because if you don't agree with them, it's a big fuss. All right. Behavior. Uh, you know, a smart person associates with nice people, smart people. You can judge a person by who they hang around with to a large degree. They get their sleep. They practice a religion. Religious people are healthier, a lot healthier, and smarter, and they achieve more than other people. I cannot tell you how many disasters I've seen when I've seen young people with talent. And what I've seen to be the two precipitating events I've most often seen, well, three precipitating events I've seen in young people where they end up destroying themselves is number one, they hang around with losers and they become alcoholics or drug addicts. Uh, number two, the parents get divorced and the kid freaks out and their performance and everything just deteriorates. Uh, number three, when kids become atheists, I've seen a lot of them just you know, become drug addicts, drop out of school, become alcoholics or commit suicide. They just go down the tubes. So those are additional reasons why religious strengthens a person and gives them a sense of meaning in life, a sense of purpose. Um, all of that is helpful to them. Okay, religion largely is something that's a friend of the poor. Big rulers don't want God-fearing religions because that puts something above them. Okay, other things, a sign of an intelligent person. They exercise, okay? They try to maintain some fitness, physical fitness. I actually think doctors should all try to be paragons of physical fitness, okay? They have to know how to take care of themselves before they're going to be uh, top-notch qualified to give advice to other persons. Okay, other signs I think of low intelligence that the person's stinking up the place with too much personal care products, okay? When some guy walks in the room and you can smell him, you know, from across the room when he steps in the door, you know, that doesn't impress me, okay? It makes you want to bolt out the other side of the room, okay? Um, you know, a lot of things like a sign of intelligence, somebody who's studied sunscreen and realizes there's more harmful chemicals than beneficial chemicals in sunscreen. So, you know, if you're stuck working outside in an outdoor job all day, you can wear a long sleeve shirt, you can wear a sombrero. Maybe you got to wear a little sunscreen on your hands or something, but... In general, I kind of noticed that in my life, too. The smarter people will tell me, oh, I don't use sunscreen because of all the bad chemicals in it. Okay, uh, I've talked about some of these other things. So being a minimalist. Being a minimalist is a sign of a smart person. A lot of the highest achievers I've met were really intensely focused on, on a few things. You know, you don't hold your cell phone close to your ear. You use a speakerphone. Okay, people who work night shift, it often uh, sort of impairs them over time. It's not a good idea to be doing that. It stresses you out. It messes up your circadian rhythms. Um, people who can't get out of bed, a lot of times that's a sign they're depressed or something's wrong if they're sleeping routinely more than nine hours a day. Okay, as far as reading and intellectual curiosity, people who don't read at all, they just tend to not be very bright. Uh, somebody who just reads a lot of magazines, you know, even if they're fluff, at least they're reading something. Uh, when somebody's a kid, I would just say let the kid read whatever they want because I'm just glad they're reading something. But, you know, the real smart people read a lot more. The smarter the doctor, the more books they read is what I've seen in my experience. Most doctors don't read anything, nothing at all, and is what I've seen. That's why I jokingly call them functional illiterates. But the smart ones are always reading. I can tell you the guys I know, like, they were, you know, top 10% of their class, Ivy Leaguers and all that stuff. They tend to read about one book a month, okay? Uh, some of them two books a month. Uh, smart people tend to listen to audiobooks. You know, any idiot can turn on the radio in the car and listen to the same stupid music, the same stupid, you know, BS news channels in the car. You know, any idiot could do that. A smarter person is going to be listening to an audiobook. You know, get something out of the commute or an educational podcast. You know, a smarter person is going to watch educational videos on their computer. You can tell, you know, these popular music videos will have billions of views because every idiot in the world is, you know, listening to songs. Don't get me wrong. There comes times when it's pleasant to listen to music. It's good to listen to music. It's nice to have it in the background. But what I'm saying is when you're in your car, if you're driving more than 20 minutes, you should be, you know, getting through books doing that. Okay, uh, smart people enjoy intellectual conversation. They can handle the nuance. And, you know, a smarter person, if they're going to listen to music, they'll often listen to classical music or Christian music, something where you can understand the words. It has some meaning to it or something. Rock and roll is kind of neutral. There's some that's better than other parts. Beat music is usually a sign of stupidity. You know, somebody, you know, if you're in your chance to be in your car listening to a novel 
or you know an intellectual thing that's going to develop your brain i don't like beat music at all i don't like loud heavy metal music if it's too harsh and boom 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 it just pushes any thought out of your head i'm always thinking about something so when you listen to beat music or really harsh heavy metal you can't think now don't get me wrong there can be some of those genres that are good okay you know uh, what's his name eminem he's an idiot savant you know even though I think he's an absolute moron. He does have some clever, and if you ever look at his writing, it's actually kind of genius level, some of it. Uh, so you can like one little tiny part of something, but think most of it is garbage. Same thing with heavy metal. Most of it is garbage, but the top 5%, Iron Maiden and a few other things can be great. Okay, education. Yeah, education more is better in general, but there's a lot of real smart people who didn't have a chance to get much education. There's tons of people with phony intellects who got college or graduate degrees. I know lots of doctors that are really stupid, okay? They just did what they had to to, to get the grade and did the work, and they had supportive families usually that helped them to get through it. Um, you know, somebody who you know didn't go to any school but started their own business and figured out how to survive in life, you know, that's pretty impressive more impressive than somebody who's just conformist and you know just got their ticket punch so to speak so they could okay diet you know obviously you can look at a person's grocery grocery cart at the grocery store and estimate their IQ you know if they're filling it up with soda pop and beer and you know all this processed junk food you know it's a stupid nutritionally stupid person um all right, the low-fat, low-sodium vegan is the best. People who watch a lot of TV, that makes you stupid. If you find yourself watching TV, that means you don't have your priorities right in life. You can't achieve anything if you're watching TV. That's a bad sign. It's a sign that you don't value your brain. You don't value your time. You don't have good goals in life. If you've got good goals, you want to pursue your goals, okay? And goal setting is one of the key steps towards achieving anything. Um, I don't even have a TV. I haven't watched TV in decades. Okay, toxic exposures. Yeah, anybody who's smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol, smoking MJ, that's a sign of a lower IQ. All those things are bad. Abusing any other substance, they're bad. So yeah, I know some people, you're going to tell me, oh, they, you know, they failed my little instant IQ test in five different categories. But if you, if you look at a whole bunch of them, it's just a way to estimate how other people are doing and how you're doing in terms of their cognitive function. Because one of the steps towards preventing you know, dementia is to build cognitive reserve. And it's easy to do if you just simply decide that you want to do it. Um, for any problem, the first step is to be aware of it. Then the second is the desire to change. The third is being willing to change. And the fourth is make it a goal and start changing. So anyways, that was kind of a fun chapter on just estimating IQ. I like that Aristotle stuff. And we're going to get into more stuff in the next chapter about developing intelligence and more sophisticated thinking and a little bit about learning strategies. Um, so anyways, hope that was helpful or interesting.